What you do in a day is nothing short of amazing. Get this, do you know that on a given day, you generate more electrical impulses in your brain than all the world's cell phones combined? Your brain is made up of over 100 billion neurons. And if you took one sheet of paper for each one of those and stacked them on top of each other, you know how high that stack would be? Over 5,000 miles high or the distance from LAX to London. But what's not so amazing is how most people don't realize their power and they're just living on autopilot and habits. It's been said that routines lull the brain to sleep. Getting caught in those thought loops that are disempowering, how can you make the changes you've always wanted to do? You need to break the habit of being yourself. And we're going over the 10 big ideas from Dr. Joe Dispenza's book on exactly that. It's Clark with Diffusion Settle. Let's go. We're going to get right into this book. Got a lot to cover. It's a big meaty book with lots of quantum physics and big fancy words I can't pronounce. To state the obvious, I am not a quantum physicist, nor am I a neuroscientist. I'll do my best though to quote what's accurate in the book and what I've researched. If you like these videos, the 10 best ideas, you can support it by hitting that like button right now. Smash it. Takes half a second. Leave me a comment if there's something that sticks out to you. And if you really like this book, I'll link down below with an affiliate link that you can support this channel on of where you can get this book for free on Audible. I want to open this video up with this study that blew my mind from the book. Researchers took a group of people and split them into four categories. These four groups were getting shown how to play the piano. They said, hey, look, we'll scan your brain before and we'll scan your brain after the two weeks of us teaching you how to play piano for two hours a day. None of these people have experience with piano and so they were completely fresh and they wanted to study what actually happens on the brain when we learn new things. And here's what happened that was shocking. Group number one, they showed how to play scales. And what they found, they scanned their brain before, they scanned it after, and they found a whole new pattern of neural connections. Makes sense, you learn something new, that's the process of neurons firing and wiring together and creating new connections. Learning is creating new connections, sustaining them is what we call memory. So by the end of the experiment, they memorized new patterns. Group number two, they said the same thing. Hey, two weeks, two hours a day, they scanned their brain before, they scanned it after. But they instructed this group, play whatever you want. You get free time with the piano. And what happened is no neural connections happened. It was essentially the same person, the same brain, because it was random and there was no pattern, so no memory happened. Group number three was the control and they had the easiest job. Researchers told them, hey, look, just show up and uh, don't actually play piano because we need some people to just prove that we have a control group. So nothing happened, nothing grew, it's the same. Where it gets really freaky and why I'm telling you this study is group number four, the last one. Researchers told them the exact same thing. Two hours a day, show up, we're scanning your brain before, and we're scanning it after, but here's what they did that no other group had. They said, listen, this group is gonna be kind of mentally straining. You're not actually going to play the piano. We're just gonna teach you how, and we're gonna have you rehearse in your mind for two hours a day. We know you're gonna get tired, so we're there to push you, but please show up for the two weeks and just think about what we're teaching you. So they would run through patterns of scales, them hitting the keys in their mind. They would rehearse this over and over again for two hours a day, two hours a day, two hours a day. What was crazy when they measured the brain at the end of the study? The exact same centers as group one who physically played and memorized and learned patterns grew in group number four who didn't even come in contact with the piano. They had similar neural connections just by mentally rehearsing that over and over in their brain. You might be thinking, what does this even mean, Clark? Like, cool story, cool study. Well, this is why it's so important, because you can extrapolate from that study that proved by just thinking about the thing actually develops new parts in your brain that your thoughts have the potential to rewire your brain, even if you can't physically experience it in the present. That just the act of imagining your future and what you want it to look like can actually change your brain and attract it to you. If you don't believe me, look, everything at some fundamental level is created twice. We know this. This freaking phone right here, the iPhone. 
You think they just pulled this out of thin air? No, they had a blueprint for it, and then they made that happen, but it started in their mind. This book started as thought, started as research, and then he compiled it, he had to think about it, and then put it in physical reality. So I know it sounds kind of woo-woo to talk about manifesting and thoughts create your reality and everything's energy, man. Like some hippies with dreadlocks and a Whole Foods. We'll back this up even more in this video. This is game-changing stuff. Joe Dispenza calls it remembering your future. Even before it's happened, you can remember your future in the present moment and then you're much more likely to take action on that same thing with the iphone when they have a vision for what they want to create and they believe they can they're actually motivated to do it okay makes sense you're following the second thing i wanted to underscore that blew my mind and it's so simple but like it stands out a lot it's not enough to just do it once that you have to train your mind to do this over and over again to get results because remember that group two randomly practiced and nothing happened Group three didn't do anything and nothing happened. That group two and three is how most people are operating through life. Okay, they're randomly doing things and hoping for change, or they're just not showing up and they're sleepwalking through life, right? Groups one and four, this is a more active process, especially group number four, because you actually have to think about it. So it's not enough to just do it once sporadically. Remember, memory is systematizing things over and over again. So let me ask you a question. Is it better to read 20 books one time or one book 20 times. Well, you know, I've read, I don't know how many books, I'm not gonna flex on you here, but I find the most benefit in rereading the books over and over and over again, because then those are your more frequent thoughts, and then those patterns happen in your life, and you're more likely to take action on it. So how I've applied this knowledge to my own life is rereading the same books that I like over and over and over again. I'm also a musician. So I've noticed this pattern in my life too. When I'm practicing music, I get more benefit from playing one song 20 times over and over again and fixing things and getting it cleaner and cleaner and cleaner than you do playing along to 20 songs one time. Remember that learning is making new connections and memory is retaining them. Your brain works just like communication in anything, like a relationship, right? The more you communicate, the more bonded you become and the stronger your communication is. The same thing internally, even if you don't have the life you want right now, you might be in a job that's unfulfilling, you might have a home that you don't like, you might have something that you wanna change. If you do this over and over again, communicate with yourself internally, like we'll tell you in this video, you have a much better chance of attracting that and manifesting that in your present moment. Joe Dispenza talks a lot about your personality and that your personality becomes your personal reality. Love that play on words. And he says your personality is made up of three things. And we're going to talk about these three things and how you can flip the script and get change fast in your life. Your thoughts, your actions, and your feelings. Another way to look at this is your personality. Think, do, be. This is how most people operate on making change. They think I have to think about something I want, then I have to do it, and then I can become the person who did it. I have to think about all the reasons of why I need to lose weight and you know become, okay, think about the best diet for myself, then I can actually do the work, and then I can become the healthy person, right? Makes sense. Now stay with me here. I'm gonna set this up and geek out a little more. This is actually backed up when you look at your brain, okay? And in Joe Dispenza's book, he talks that you don't just have one brain, you actually have three that work together as one. Neocortex, all right, your frontal lobe. This is the most developed part of your brain. It's biggest in humans. I believe dogs and cats have like three or 7% of the capacity that we do. Bigger animals like dolphins and elephants and whales, they have a much more developed neocortex as well. That's why they're smarter. What you're listening to right now and why you're understanding this video is with your frontal lobe, your conscious mind right here. Next up, we have our limbic brain. This is the emotional center of your brain. This brain's job is to regulate chemical order. It's about the size of a lemon in your brain and it's the emotional brain, okay? So this sets on the emotions or turns them off. Lastly, I'll translate this for you for the chicken scratch. This is your cerebellum. This is the reptilian brain. It's the oldest, most primitive part of you. Also the seat of your subconscious mind. Those impulses, those habits, that comes from there. A lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is to survive, right? Now let's tie this together and then I'll set it up with a couple points and then you know tie it all together, stay with me here. So thinking to doing to being, this is the way we process now. We think about something, right? Then we can do it, then we can become it. But this is really hard because have you ever heard that you have 60,000 thoughts a day? Yeah, well, that's what researchers study. And a majority of those thoughts are the same as the day before. So when we're looking at this, a majority of your thoughts are actually here that you're not conscious of. 
they're in your subconscious or your unconscious mind. Good example of this is you can drive the same route to work every single day over and over again and get there and you kind of zoned out the whole time and you're like, oh my God, how did that even happen? I don't even remember driving there. That's because a majority of those thoughts are in the unconscious, they're habitual. And if you want to form new neural connections, you got to step out of that. To fully understand this, we got to understand two more concepts, okay? This model right here is Newtonian. And we're gonna talk about the quantum one as well. Up until the last 100 years, we operated from the Newtonian model of physics. Again, I'm not a physicist, but this basically in layman's terms says that it's only what can be weighed or measured that is true. This is what the atom looked like according to Newtonian physics right here. That we kind of understand it. We know there's particles, we know there's atoms, neutrons, electrons, all that stuff floating around. And we thought we knew everything, right? We thought this was how it worked. Yep, seal the book, close it, and we are good. But I wanna apply this to our life. When we're talking about that model I showed you of thinking, doing, then being, that is the Newtonian model of change. It basically says that something outside of ourself has to happen to internally feel good, to internally feel successful, to make a change, something outside of us happens and we internally change. But then something crazy happened around the 1900s. This is the rise of quantum physics and it shattered pretty much everything we knew about Newtonian physics and really changes the game. Kind of just like we thought back in the day the earth was flat, I guess some people today still do believe it's flat. And then we discovered it was round and it totally changed the game and we accepted it's true. Just like we thought everything revolved around the earth and then we realized, oh no, we're just narcissistic. We think we're the center of the universe, but we actually revolve around the sun. This is kind of one of those things. And enter quantum physics. In the 1900s is when people really started discovering this. Full transparency, we're still learning a lot about it and there's still new research coming to the forefront because we don't fully understand it. And it's really technical and even if you watch 50,000 YouTube videos on it, there's still questions. One of the studies that explains quantum physics, because people can talk about this and then it just makes you more confused, but I've really tried to dumb it down for myself and explain it in layman's terms. I think I just appreciate that explanation. The double slit test. This is one of the best experiments proving quantum physics. It went something like this. I have Joe Dispenza's book and I'm gonna throw it across the room right there. And over there on that side, off camera, there's two doors, okay? So I have this book and I throw it. What do you think would happen? You're like, well, of course it would either hit the wall or go through one of the doors. Stupid question, Clark. Yeah, well, that's how Newtonian physics works. This book, throw it, goes through one of those options right there. That's what, it makes sense, it's simple. And so in the double slit test, that's what they expected to happen. They had a particle, hey, we have two doors, it's gonna go through one of these. But what happened blew their mind. They had this book, and they took it and they threw it, and it went through two doors at the same time. And when they'd study it, it would actually change. Sometimes it would be one, sometimes it would be two, sometimes the actually act of studying something would change how that particle behaved. People are like, what the heck? Is this a magic trick? Is this a Houdini? This isn't a Chris Angel mind freak trick. It actually happened. But think about this. This isn't too crazy when we actually think this through. If I have a song playing right now, what is that? That's a sound wave. And if we're playing this sound wave, it's floating all around us. It's going through multiple doors. And so what they found is that at the quantum level, energy behaves as a wave, not as a particle. And that waves are not just physical pieces of matter, but they're actually energy. This is the quantum model of how we operate. And it backs up the hippie saying that some smelly dude in Whole Foods is saying, everything is energy, man. I mean, at a certain level, he's correct. It's just more complex. What we can extrapolate from this and what Joe talks about in this book is that we're all connected that the collective energy field influences us all. Just like there's radio waves and 5G floating out there, right? And cell phone waves, and it's going all over, it's invisible, we can't see it, or electricity floating around. At some level, that's colliding, that's meshing, that's like the quantum field, and we have that within us and our thoughts and each other. Everything is mostly empty space at the quantum level. When you look at it, it's 99.999999999 empty space. Now let's go back to the whiteboard and really tie a bow on all of this and bring it home for you. What if there was a way to ditch this Newtonian way of being, which goes from here to here to here, think, do, be. What if there's a faster way? That faster way is to be, do, then think. You become what you want, then you can do, and then you, your thoughts change in tandem with that. Act as if. 
You know, people say like, fake it till you make it. Dress for the job you want, not the job you have, right? So wear a suit and then you'll become successful and become rich. But the problem is sometimes when you're wearing a suit or whatever, you already feel unworthy. And so it doesn't change you at the core. So even if you're wearing suits, it doesn't really matter. So once you become the person who's worthy enough of that, then you can do, then you can think and you get the results you want and your life starts to change. So the Newtonian way again is saying what's outside of me to feel good internally. And what the quantum way of doing this and what this book is saying is what's inside of me represents what the outside is, that I can feel good internally and then my life starts to change. That once I become happy, then I do happy and I think happy. Not the other way around. Logically, I'm gonna think myself happy, I'm gonna read thousands of books on happiness and then I can do stuff that makes me happy and then I can finally be happy. The people who try to figure everything out and logically think, think, think their way through stuff, like philosophers, a lot of them killed themselves and were super depressed no matter how much they learned. If anything, you ever know people who are just blissful and they're kind of, I don't mean this offensively, but they're uh, beautifully ignorant, right? Like they don't really realize what's happening around them and they're happy, okay? Or kids, they don't have all this knowledge of how the world works, right? They just are, they're just happy, they're just being. And so they're happy. But once we become an adult and we learn about bills and we learn about taxes and we learn about, you know, all this stuff happening politically in the world, then we think, 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 do, 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 be, be, be and naturally we become less happy. But kids, they go be, do, think. They're happy and then they're doing and they're thinking and it reinforces that behavior. Right here is changing the way you look at things. And as the great Wayne Dyer once said, when I was scrubbing spots, broke, depressed, living in my mom's basement, 30K in debt, and I was a janitor scrubbing toilets, I would listen to these audiobooks over and over and over again. And the one quote from Wayne Dyer that stuck with me and resonated at the core is this. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. When you change the way you go from being, doing, thinking, everything around you starts to change. Your thinking changes, your habits change, and it starts by becoming that person, by stepping into your full power. Fake it till you make it is wrong. Become the person you were always born to be and act as if is right. Trying to force the things you look at to change and be like, no, this has to be a certain color. This blue right here, I, I want it to be red. I want it to be red. It's not gonna happen. Changing the way I look at things, maybe this doesn't have to be red. Maybe I can just accept it as blue. Then the things I look at change. Working with a limited budget here. One of my all time favorite stories goes like this. Michelangelo who built the statue of David. You go there, you see it in a museum. It's just beautiful. It's miraculous. It's perfection. When he was getting interviewed by someone, people were talking, hey, how did you build this? How did you construct this David? How did you know what it was going to look like? You know what he said? David was already in the statue. All I did was chip away the marble. I love that and I get goosebumps every time. That inside this giant chunk of marble, there was already a statue of David in there. And all he had to do was chip it away, chisel by chisel at a time. And I think at the end of the day, that's what this book is saying, that you already have some ideal version of you inside of you. And it's just your job to chip away at the marble or step into your greatness or step into your power. And that when you do this consistently over and over and over again, it's like practicing those scales and the ideal version of you naturally starts to burst out. But think about this. What actually has to happen to make that a reality? You have to think greater than your environment. Every great thinker knew this that you look up to, whether it was Gandhi, whether it was MLK, whether it was Steve Jobs, they all thought greater than their environment. They all thought something was possible and they took action on it and they kept that vision alive, that at the core of everything you wanna do is that vision right there. It's like a flame that you gotta protect, just like they protect the Olympic torch flame, right? And it continues to burn and they pass the torch on because that's precious, so is your vision. That's what Napoleon Hill talks about in Think and Grow Rich, right? That you need this flame inside of you and as you fan it and give it oxygen and all the right environment, your passion, your goals, your mission is gonna erupt. And you need to keep that alive and you can't let the world or yourself dull it down. They literally trained their mind with a thousand percent certainty that this was going to work. And it did, for all of them. 
their visions came true. It wasn't just enough to see it, but they actually had an emotional charge behind the work they were doing. A memory without an emotional charge, that's just called wisdom. So how do you actually drop this? How do you break the habit of being yourself? Joe Dispenza talks a lot about the power of meditation. It's like the last third of the book and he gives exercises on how to do it. And I know firsthand about meditation, not that I'm the expert, right? But I've been practicing it now for uh, consistently for about four or five months and I've seen massive benefits. And at first you get into it and you're like, man, this is boring, I'm fidgety, I wanna itch my nose, I wanna get up, and you have all these excuses coming up. This isn't really benefiting, this doesn't work for me, I'm not doing it right, maybe I need a thousand dollar transcendental meditation mantra, right, or whatever. But I wanna try and simplify it in this point. In the Tibetan language, right, Tibetan Buddhists, you know what the word meditation means? To become familiar with. That's it. Meditation is a cin cinnamon, cin cinnamon, synonym, however you pronounce that, cinnamon sugar, for self-observation. And more importantly, meditation opens the door in your brain and your body between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. All you're doing when you're meditating is just observing yourself. You're not supposed to do it right. No one's doing it right. There is no right way. You're just sitting there and observing. Through meditation is how you can install new patterns and break down ones that aren't serving you. I want you to think about it in your meditation. Maybe you're sitting there remembering your future. You're rebuilding it just like those piano players we talked about, right? They're going over the scales in their mind. They're building new neural connections and then they actually miraculously what happens is the same parts in their brain grow. The final point is this. It's not a point. It's not a study. It's an invitation. I want I want to remind you that you are amazing and there's literally nobody else out there that is like you. Remember that you generate more electrical impulses in your brain alone than all the cell phones in the world combined. But you have to break the habit of being yourself if you want to step into your full power in the future. I want to invite you to remove those blocks that's held you back in the past. I want to invite you to be here in the present right now and enjoy it more because knowing that the past is an illusion and so is the future because when you experience it, you're in the present moment. I want to invite you to drop the, I'm not good enough, I'm not qualified, nobody loves me, nobody wants to invite me, I can't, I struggle with, drop all of that. And the way you do that is with this. The question becomes, are you willing to rehearse your future? Are you willing to adopt a thousand percent certainty that it's going to be better, that you have the power to change, that as soon as you work on yourself and do the work, you're building these neural connections that change your life. Remember that you can be, then do, then think. You don't have to think, do, then be. That you have the power to make a change right now, moving forward. So build those circuits in your mind. Look into meditation, look into books, trust yourself at the core, listen to that inner voice. And to break the habit of being yourself, you might have to lose your mind to create a new one. You got this. This is Clark with Diffusing the Settle. Stop settling, start living. See ya.